So hello everyone. Welcome to my latest organ technology video. It's been a while. Now if you're one of my supporters over on Patreon, you've heard what's been going on last couple of months that has kept me away from doing a lot of these YouTube videos, but we're back on track now and uh, we're going to take a look today at something a little different. We've spent a lot of time looking at the 33E, an old, very old analog technology organ. Today we're going to take a look at my Johannes 4-manual organ and a problem I've been having with that instrument and a possible repair to that instrument. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a little tour of the inside of the Johannes and see just exactly what the basic components are of a digital organ. We've gone over the com basic components of a analog technology organ where we're using analog synthesis uh, to simulate the sounds of a pipe organ. Most digital organs use sample playback. A little recording of an actual organ pipe is played back when you hit the key. So the interior of the instrument is very different, how it goes together, and the kind of parts and components you're going to be dealing with are going to be a little different. So first, here's a picture of the Johannes 4-manual organ. Uh, this was originally built for the NAMM show in 1997. Uh, it went to a church down in Southern California for a while. Uh, it ended up as a trade-in with the dealership I work for. And we decided that because of its overwhelming size and its age a little bit and the fact that it was a one-of-a-kind and can be problematic uh, to maintain, uh, we decided that it just was going to be got rid of and I decided to take it to my home. And so now it's in my studio and I use it as my practice instrument. I've also made a number of music videos on it and uh, it's been a fun instrument to have, but it is suffering some trouble. So we're gonna take a look at that and see just maybe what's going on there. Okay, so the first thing that happens inside a digital organ, like every other electronic uh, operation, we have to have a power supply. The line current that comes in from our homes is a uh, 110 volts alternating current, and we need to convert that into various forms of direct current. That's true of your computer, it's true of the 33E, it's true of your digital piano, um, and it's, of course, true of this uh, digital organ. So we start with transformers. Transformers are a pretty simple device, it's a pair of coils. It relies on alternating current and that constant back and forth to induce a current on a secondary coil. So you have a primary coil that the 110 volt line current comes into and then you have a secondary coil. And because of the difference in the ratio of coils, you get a different voltage on the output side. So in this case, we've got 24 and 15 volts coming out of each of these transformers. Now, once we step down the electricity, then of course we have to go to really the heart of any power supply and that's the rectification and regulation circuits. Most of what you're seeing in this shot, you see there's uh, kind of on the left and across the left hand top side, there's some junction boards. This is where the uh, uh, pistons on the keyboards are, 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 are handled and multiplexed and all of that good stuff. But if you look at the, the three big circuit boards with the fins on them, the big black things, those are the regulation and filtering circuits and so we have that alternating current and even though it's down at a voltage we may need we also need to smooth that out into dc current and that's what these devices do so then uh, the next thing we're looking at this is the main processor board now what we have here is a microprocessor uh, that has there's three on this board 
And then there's a bunch of memory circuits. Those are right in the middle going from left to right, up and down. Uh, those are EEPROMs, and that's where all the computer firmware and software is that runs this particular organ. Along the bottom of that circuit board, you'll see a whole bunch of wire junctions. The ones on the left with the ribbon cables, that's where the keyboards come into the main processor board. And on the right, that is where the uh, draw knobs come into the main processor board. So basically, this is a little purpose-built computer. And it also operates some secondary computers. And that's what we're going to see next. So these panels, you can kind of see on the top, there is a series of circuit boards that are stacked right next to each other. These are sometimes referred to as the voice boards. Basically, these are a secondary computer that has on it stored these digital samples, the little recordings of the pipes and in this case each of these boards will hold i think it's either four or eight stops uh it's probably eight and it will only handle eight notes of polyphony so each group of stops is divided onto two separate voice boards and you have every other note on each of those boards. So let's say board one has uh, the eight foot principle from the grate. Board two will also have the eight foot principle from the grate, but board one will have notes C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and board number two will have notes C sharp, D sharp, F, G, A, B. You can see this done with organ pipes. When you see a rank of organ pipes and you have it coming down maybe from outside to inside or from center going out or maybe in two rows in, in a couple of wedges. And what they've done is every other note. So let's say we're doing the M-shaped thing. We're going to go C, C-sharp, D, D-sharp, E, F, F-sharp, G. Now back to the picture of these boards. The reason to divide them up is because of the eight-note polyphony limit. If you divide the every other note onto two separate boards, then you have effectively generated a 16-note polyphony. Now, these polyphony limits are one of the things that is really kind of inherent in any digital musical instrument. And... The further back you go, the more restrictive those polyphony issues were. This is one of the reasons why, even to this day, most of your digital organs do not have octave couplers, you know, swell to swell four foot, swell to swell 16, and so forth. Because each of those octave couplers doubles the amount of polyphony that the uh, system has to handle. If you're running Hotverk, a virtual organ on your computer, you will run into the same problem if you use a lot of octave couplers or a lot of unification. You are ultimately going to run into a situation where the computer processor will only handle so many samples being played back at a single time. In looking at this instrument, I was having a very specific problem. The draw knobs started to behave erratically. You would hit a piston and draw knobs that should not have been connected to that piston were lighting up. Draw knobs that shouldn't have been connected to that piston were not lighting up. Uh, when you went to try and reset that piston, it would not set. Uh, I would get different things each time I hit that piston. What's going on there? The other thing that was happening was the keyboards weren't working. Now, a word of caution here in analyzing this. The fact that I'm getting wonky behavior from the draw knobs 
and that the keyboards are not working does not mean there's a singular problem causing both, but it could be. Now, I had to kind of deduce what was a possible issue on this. So the first thing you do when you're looking at any electronic device is you test for power. And this includes, by the way, is it plugged in? Now I know that you've heard that before. Did you plug it in? And that sounds like a silly, a silly thing for a technician to say to somebody. Of course they plugged it in. But did that plug in, is that plug in successful? Any number of times I've gone over to a client's house, pulled the organ out from the wall, and yes, it's plugged in. The problem is the receptacle is so worn out that it's not gripping that plug properly, and so the electricity is intermittent. The other thing that happens is maybe the circuit breaker is thrown, and the organ is the only thing operating on that circuit. You go flip the breaker, and it comes back on. So when a technician like me comes in and says, is it plugged in, or checks to see if it's plugged in, we're really checking for something a little deeper than, is it plugged in? You really have to check that whole line and make sure that you're getting power from the house current all the way to those transformers that we looked at earlier and, and into the power supply and that we've actually got power. The next thing you want to do is take your volt ohm meter and go around and make sure that the all of the little the rectifier regulator parts of the power supply are putting out the voltages that we're supposed to have. Now, on most Johannes instruments, we're going to have 12 volts, 5 volts, and 2.5 volts. So you want to test. Now, I don't have the exact documentation on all of this stuff, so I have to kind of check around and see, okay, am I getting those voltages in various locations, and are, does that make sense? And yeah, okay, I've got voltage and everything. And uh, so going around, make sure all of that works. But then we came down to, all right, what could be possibly causing that problem? I had to go on a little bit of a hunch. And I had to think, all right, what would give me wonky behavior from the draw knobs and possibly also not allow the keyboards to communicate with the central processor unit? Well, I remembered in a class I took at the Rogers factory where we were discussing uh, various problems that have been run into in the field. And there was a particular organ model from the early 90s, one of the early digital instruments, and it had a very specific issue. It would suddenly behave wonky, give you oddball stuff that wasn't supposed to ha be happening, and or it wouldn't play. And the culprit was the crystal oscillator. Now here's a picture of the crystal oscillator that resides on the main processor board in the Johannes instrument. Now what this does is set the timing. Now all digital stuff is basically, your, you can think of it this way, the central processor on the computer only wants to deal with one thing at a time. And so Everything that you're doing at the control surfaces, all the control surfaces have to be scanned many, many times a second, and their on-off condition has to be sent to the processor one thing at a time. This is called serial data. Well, obviously, everything has to be timed accurately for that to work. The scanning of the keyboard has to be synchronized with the output side of the processor board so that the right samples on the right cards get triggered, the right lights on the right draw knobs get lit, and so forth. So if that crystal oscillator is not oscillating correctly, then you can have a problem. Now on the Rogers instrument, 
the crystal oscillator was fitted to a socket and the socket was soldered to the main processor board. The solution was very simple. Pop the crystal oscillator out, set it aside, remove that socket and solder the crystal oscillator directly to the main processor board. Now, without an oscilloscope, which I do not own, you can't really test to see if that crystal oscillator is, is, has failed. So this was really just a hunch on my part that maybe that crystal oscillator was causing these problems with my Johannes in organ. So I did a little research on how these crystal oscillators fail and the kinds of things that happen when they do fail. And typically, they don't just shut down. Uh, they start sending out a less than symmetrical waveform. Well, if you're having to rigidly time something, then the waveform coming off of that oscillator is very critical. Or the timing will start to drift one direction or another. Obviously, that would create uh, a potential problem where you would get wonky behavior and some things simply not working. Well, then I looked up the part itself, and it's $2.50, so I thought, well, let's just get one and try it. So we got into the organ, and so obviously the first thing I had to do was remove the old crystal oscillator, and that involved pulling up the main processor board and then desoldering the crystal oscillator. So this involves some solder wick and getting the solder joints hot. The solder wick soaks up that excess solder. And once I had the old oscillator loose, then I went ahead and soldered it in. And after that was done, we had our fresh crystal oscillator in place. I then turned the board over, put it back in place, and turned the organ on to give it a try. And, well, everything worked. Everything worked just fine. The draw knob started behaving correctly, the capture action was setting properly, and all the keys played. Now, like I said at the beginning, well, the fact that I was getting wonky behavior from the draw knobs and the keys weren't playing did not mean that the same problem was causing that. So the keyboards have been intermittent ever since. So let's go back and take a look at that main processor board and see where what might be going on there. Now you can see that there's all of these pin connectors. The ones, the blue ones with all the individual wires go to the draw knobs. And the ribbon cables on the left with the white connectors, those go over to the keyboards. At the keyboard, there's a similar connection into a circuit board that runs the contact system. So we might have any number of problems here that are causing the keyboards to behave intermittently. When you have pin connectors, you can get oxidation between the pin and the connector over time, and that can create an intermittent connection. And again, on a digital system where we're having to scan through everything many times a second, well, even one pin having a bad connection can cause the whole that whole thing to fail. Now one of the things I probably should have done when I was doing my basic run through of what's going on with this organ is I probably should have opened up every one of those pin connectors and cleaned them thoroughly with some contact clean. Clean both the pin side and the socket side and then re connect everything up. So you usually go through one pin connector at a time. Well, 
there's a lot of pin connectors in here <laughs> to deal with. So I didn't do that, but if it was a client's organ, I would have done that uh, just as a matter of practice. So now with both this big Johannes instrument and my 33E, I've known all along that at some point I was going to be gutting the electronics out of these instruments and converting them to be MIDI controllers and then just run Hotverk, the computer based simulator of, of a pipe organ. Um, maybe that time has come with the big Johannes. And uh, next time we're going to take a look at the 33E and a really interesting problem that's cropped up there. And we're going to see if maybe that time has come for the 33E. And then I have to decide, okay, do I really want two big organ consoles in my studio? Or if I'm going to run Hopwork, do I want just one of them and uh, just have one singular Hopwork controller? But at any rate, we're going to take a look at the 33E next time. And we're going to see just uh, what's going on with the tuba stop on that one. That really sounds bad. At any rate... I know this one was kind of long, but we had a lot of, lot of ground to cover. Uh, I will do a little more work on the Johannes 4 manual and see if I can get those keyboards to work consistently. And uh, I will, of course, take pictures and we can make a video about that. I also have a number of interesting projects I'm doing for outside clients. And I'm going to shoot some video of those and we'll have some fun videos to look at. At any rate, I'm going to see you next time. Next time we'll look at the 33E. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for your patience on getting this video out. And we'll see you again.